Welcome to 117th Theoretical Physics Colloquium by Professor Sasa Krasdonov uh, from Higgs Center for Theoretical Physics, University of Edinburgh and University of Ljubljana. Uh, he received his PhD in 2014 from the University of Oxford, and then he became a postdoctoral fellow at Leiden University, and he spent there three years until 2017. In 2017, he became senior associate, uh, postdoctoral associate at uh, MIT, where he also spent about three years, and he became an associate professor at the University of Ljubljana uh, in Slovenia uh, in 2020, where he remains since then. He is also a faculty member and Ernst Rutherford Fellow at the Higgs Center for Theoretical Physics at the University of Edinburgh since 2021. And, um, Basically, that's when his fellowship, which is very competitive in UK fellowship, started at um, Edinburgh. His research interests include uh, hydrodynamics, effective field theory of hydrodynamics, gauge gravity duality, viscous hydrodynamics, magnetohydrodynamics, quantum cares, physics of neutron stars, heavy ion collisions, and many other things that I'll probably forgot to mention. And today he will be talking about strong field magnetohydrodynamics. And with that, I'll pass on the microphone to Sasa. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much for the introduction, Igor. It's uh, very nice to be a part of this uh, by now sort of already famous colloquium. Uh, many wonderful talks uh, have been given through this colloquium, so it's quite an honor to actually also be on the other side of the microphone. So what am I going to talk about today? So the topic of my talk today is magnetohydrodynamics. Uh, in particular, what I would like to tell you is that we have something new to say about how magnetohydrodynamics behaves uh, in the presence of strong magnetic fields. Okay, and so um, given that this is sort of a, it's a small group of people, please do uh, feel free at any point to stop me and ask questions. Um, okay, good. So I want to start with a sort of a general kind of motivation. So the general motivation for me from the point of view of magnetohydrodynamics and sort of the kind of things that I've been interested in is in the effective description of a variety of different states of matter. So there's a sort of a, a number of picture here on the screen. Uh, so what do they all have in common? Well, the first one is the sun. So, you know, it's a massively hot bowl of helium that's undergoing some kind of fusion process. Then we have sort of a picture of tokamak, which is again, kind of a fusion process, uh, you know, that we can sort of do on earth maybe. Uh, then we have a picture of what we know as the quark gluon plasma, which is sort of slightly different in a sense. It's, it's, uh, it's still a plasma in a sense, uh, not sort of plasma in the most conventional <laughs> uh, way of phrasing that word, but it's certainly something that has sort of given us an enormous amount of insight into new physics, we can sort of perform various very interesting experiments on Earth, at CERN, at Brookhaven. There are new uh, things being designed in order to, to, to probe sort of more details of quark gluon plasma and so on. So these are all very, very interesting things. And then on the bottom, I have two pictures of the neutron star, which is also in some sense, one can say that is filled with a, with a, with a phase of matter that's called a plasma. And so I will also try to say something new about that today. So the general sort of outline of what I would like to say today is that we have a sort of a new way of using properties of quantum field theories and effective field theories and also holography that should allow us to say something generically new about a behavior of all of these states of matter. These are all examples of plasmas. And as we know, plasma in its most infrared low energy limit is described by a theory of magnetohydrodynamics. So what I want to do today is first, I want to sort of take you on this journey of what are these new types of ultraviolet properties, these new, what we call symmetries. Uh, what is this language that can help us say something new about magnetohydrodynamics? Then I want to talk about magnetohydrodynamics in some generality. And then eventually I would actually really like to get to our most recent uh, example of the systems that we've been studying. And in particular, we believe that we can say something very concrete new about neutron stars. So uh, the rough outline, as I already said, I want to tell you about these QFT, EFT holography structures called higher form symmetries, which were kind of crucial for us in order to be able to write down these 
new effective theories of magnetohydrodynamics. Then I want to go on and actually describe what is magnetohydrodynamics, first from the sort of historical textbook point of view, and then from our sort of new, uh, now when I say new, this is sort of uh, the first incarnation of this is now already roughly, I guess, four or five years old. I will tell you what this theory is, what kind of generic predictions it gives us in the strong field limit. And then I want to talk about very briefly about holography, because that's also something that I've been very interested in. And, you know, holography is a sort of a very nice tool for giving us very concrete results uh, about the kind of things that we're interested in, for example, even measuring, but that we don't really have a particularly a good way of calculating. OK, and then I want to finish with this new application, which will be to do with magnetic diffusion in neutron stars. And this is really very new stuff. This is from 2022, 23. Uh, okay, I will finish with some summary and you know discussion of the general future directions of what I personally think are the most interesting directions in this business. Okay, so let's start with the discussion of higher form symmetries. Uh, what this is, so so we are all quite you know um, comfortable with the fact that symmetries play a very very important role in our description of physics. Okay, so if you think about, for example writing down a quantum field theory, or you want to write down an effective field theory, or you want to write down some kind of holographic model of something, there are these various ingredients that we're quite comfortable with and that we sort of find indispensable from using in our description of reality, okay? The description of particle physics and various sort of effective descriptions. And, you know, this is some extremely biased list of these things, very, very non-objective. So what are these things, right, that we normally encode in our fundamental theories? Well, one is certainly unitarity. We like unitarity because of quantum mechanics. We then, for example, have to choose some set of degrees of freedom with which we're going to work with. We're also quite happy with the sense of locality so that the sort of fundamental theories preserve some, some sense of locality. And in particular, the interactions we believe in these fundamental theories are local interactions. And then there is this sort of ingredient that comes in that you know we learn is sort of indispensable for everything it's called the symmetry so we really you know symmetries have been extremely powerful in the description of basically everything in physics uh and you know we sort of take all of these ingredients and we kind of <laughs> make them invariant under the symmetries of the theory uh, that we would like to obey okay now in very very broad terms symmetries can be divided into two classes so we have gauge symmetries, which are local symmetries, okay, like the, what is governing the gauge groups of, of the standard model, and the other ones are global symmetries. So today I will uh, purely talk about global symmetries, and these higher form symmetries are sort of a, a new way of looking at certain types of symmetries that people may not have looked at in the past. Now, I would sort of, sort of from, I don't know, one interesting point of view on the symmetries that I've been thinking a lot recently, not that I have anything particularly interesting to say about it, but sort of we really heavily rely on symmetries because, you know, we know that they're very useful, but in a sense, physics has a sort of a, I would say kind of a love-hate relationship with symmetries. So for example, you know, we all know that gauge symmetries, which are, you know, half of these symmetries that I'm talking about, uh, are not really real in the sense that, you know, they're often called redundancies in the description. In principle, we could maybe do without, if that's unclear. Uh, and even global symmetries are also not really a friend of fundamental theories, because we also know that, for example, in quantum gravity, any kind of theory of quantum gravity does not really permit global symmetry. So, you know, even though symmetries are sort of indispensable uh, in terms of, you know, using them for describing just about anything, um, gauge symmetries are fake and global symmetries don't exist. So, you know, I think it's a sort of an interesting situation that we have in physics. Um, it's not, of course, really clear how to go beyond this kind of a description, but I just sort of wanted to start with this sort of a slightly provocative thought, which, of course, I think that all of you know, but, but you know, so for most of what I'll, I'll be talking about today, I will talk about things that quantum gravity does not permit, which are global symmetries. So everything that I'll be, I'll be talking about today will be about sort of global symmetries and how we can use these new things called global higher form symmetries in order to say something new about realistic states of matter. So let me start with that. So what are global symmetries? Well, we know that global symmetries sort of 
act you know, globally on the operators that are charged under one particular symmetry. So for example, the usual type of global symmetry will have, you will have some kind of a local operator, let's call it O, and under the action of the symmetry, it will be rotated uh, in this way. So it's phased, you know, but will change as e to the i, some kind of q times lambda, whatever this is. The point is that whatever is this exponent does not depend on x, okay? So this is the global symmetry. And in this new language, we call this a zero form symmetry um, because the operators are sort of uh, defined at zero dimensional locations, okay? They're de defined locally and something that's defined at a point, point is a zero dimensional thing. We now nowadays like to call these sort of zero form symmetries. These are the standard all symmetries. Now, what we know, what, what do these symmetries do, right? So for example, what they do is, for example, count the number of particles. They can also count the number of charges in some box. So, you know, this is sort of a cartoon picture of what is a zero form symmetry. It's some kind of a, it, it's a beast that is, you know, of it, the charge of this thing is able to count the total number of particles if that's conserved or the total charge. But in any sense, it counts the number of zero dimensional objects in a 3D volume, okay? So what is crucial is that such a symmetry has an associated current if it's a continuous symmetry. And I will only talk about continuous symmetries by another theorem, there's a vector or rather maybe a slightly better word for this in, in this context is a, it, there's a one form current that is conserved, okay? Like this. Now. What sort of transpired over the last, now it's already almost 10 years, is that one can sort of put higher form symmetries on precisely the same footing as the standard zero form symmetries. So what are they? So for example, if we focus on one form symmetries, so these are essentially symmetries um, for which the operators are defined on one dimensional objects. So you should think of them as Wilson lines or Toft lines or Wilson loops, Toft loops and something like this, okay? So they're called one symmetry, one form symmetries because they act on these one dimensional objects. And from the point of view of this one dimensional object, the operator that's defined on a line, they sort of rotate the phase, okay? Like this, sort of this is the standard sort of rotation of, 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 of a line operator W, which is defined on C, which is some kind of a contour. Now, these are one form symmetries. So what they do is kind of analogous to what the zero form symmetry would do. For example, the easiest thing you can think of is that they count the number of one dimensional objects, i.e. strings, piercing a two dimensional surface, okay? If I'm working in three plus one spatial dimensions. So these are called one form symmetries. And just like zero form symmetries have a one form conserved current, these guys have a two form conserved current, okay? So there's a JMU nu, which is associated with such a continuous one form symmetry that is an anti-symmetric two tensor, okay? And it's conserved. Now you can of course promote this to a P form symmetry in a sort of a sort of a, you know, obvious way. There's symmetries that act on, on operators which are defined on higher dimensional uh, uh, contours or, or, or lines and then brains and so on. And for each of these symmetries, there's a Q, the charge, which is conserved, and you can calculate it with this Hodge dual, okay? Just, this is the same as, it's just a higher dimensional generalization of the usual three-dimensional integral of J zero, which will give us a charge of the zero form symmetry, okay? Now, the important thing about these things is that these things actually exist. So let's think of electrodynamics, just Maxwell theory without any matter. So actually such a theory has, two one-form symmetries. They're both U1 one-form symmetries. And what they do is they count the number of electric fluxes and they count the number of magnetic fluxes, okay? So there's a one-form symmetry, which has a current J mu nu, which is defined as the Hodge dual of the electromagnetic field tensor F. This is J mu nu. So this is the object which you can use to count the number of magnetic fluxes, right? This is equivalent to the magne to magnetic Gauss's law. There's also its Hodge dual, which is just the usual F mu nu. And that, if you have no matter, will count the number of magnetic fluxes in this way that I described. Now, if you couple electromagnetism to matter, then we know because our, you know, we have matter with, you know, which, which is charged. So we have electric charges. Actually, the one form symmetry associated to the conservation of electric flux lines is broken. So it doesn't exist, for example, in quantum electrodynamics, but the magnetic one does persist. And this is a result of the fact that, well, to the best of our knowledge, or at least at scales where we live, we have no magnetic monopoles, okay? So the fact that we have no magnetic monopoles means that the number of magnetic flux lines is conserved 
in this sense through some kind of a two dimensional surface. Okay. And this is, you know, this is sort of a fancy way of saying what, for example, Gauss's law already tells us. This is done purely from the point of view of a global symmetry. Now, of course, you can say so this statement that Jamie knew, which is defined as epsilon f. So if f is written in terms of a, the gauge field a, right? So in that case, Jamie Jam knew is just this. So it's just, you know, epsilon d rho a sigma. And in that case, if you write it out in terms of a, then the fact that Jamie knew is conserved is a sort of a tautological statement. Okay, it's a topological tautological statement, which isn't really particularly useful because, well, you know, it's two out of four Maxwell's equations, but it, it, it sounds like a triviality. So what I would like to claim today is that actually for various states of matter like plasma, it is not a triviality. And you can actually make use of this because in such a state of matter, this A, which is a massless photon field is, you know, something complicated, dressed and so on. Okay, so this is sort of where we're going. So these symmetries, uh, let me just give you a few general properties. I obviously won't have time to go into the details of this stuff, but they're basically like, like any other normal symmetry, they have various properties that we're used to. So what is perhaps a little bit special is that if these symmetries are continuous in this sense that I discussed here, so that they have an associated another current, then they must be abelian, okay? And only discrete symmetries can be non-abelian. So for someone like me, who is, let's say, interested in hydrodynamics, which is a theory of conserved operators, you know, one is usually confined to the, uh, to the situation that these symmetries are abelian, okay? Now, these symmetries, like any other global symmetry, can be broken. So there can be spontaneous symmetry breaking. And so basically everything gets an extra index. So, you know, if you have a normal zero form symmetry that undergoes spontaneous symmetry breaking, well, we know that such a symmetry will, that, sorry, that such a theory will now develop a Goldstone mode, some theta, and this Goldstone mode will be, the action of it will be invariant under shift symmetry, okay? We theta have going a question. Theta plus. Oh, yes, please. Ah, uh, Rene, please go ahead. Hi, so, so, um, yeah, uh, nice to see you. So can you give a simple, like, intuitive argument why they have to be a billion? It's like in string theory, we know there exist things like non-abelian t-duality and so on, which act on, you know, these discretized version of d-brains and so on. So yeah, I, yeah, there, yeah, there, yeah, there it, it, right. So basically, it's it's the fact that if you write down, it's kind of this usual argument of that if if you write down two op, say you you want to calculate the two consecutive operators that you insert into the path integral, okay? So basically mm -hmm. what happens, let's, let's say you want to compute, I don't know, O1, O2, okay? Mm -hmm. Now what happens for these higher form symmetries mm -hmm. is that basically they're integrated over lower dimensional uh, surfaces. So what you see is that as soon as you have a higher form symmetry, you can continuously deform these surfaces like that without mm -hmm. changing anything. So that basically first you, you, you insert them like this, you take the limit together, and then you can continuously deform them and do this. Mm -hmm. And so you can show that basically any, anything must like this defined in this way must be abelian. So that, that's, that's the most intuitive argument for this, okay? You just show that O1, O2 is equal to O2, O1. So therefore, you know, this, it must be an abelian symmetry. That, okay. that, that's the intuitive argument. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Yeah, very good. So, so for zero form symmetries, the result of spontaneous symmetry breaking are zero form fields, right? They're scalar fields. These are Goldstone modes. So they're invariant under shift symmetry, which is a constant. And this has, you know, an effective infrared action, which is just this. It's d mu theta, d mu theta. Okay, or if you want to sort of write it in sort of fancier, uh, higher, uh, sorry, uh, differential form language is d theta wedge star d theta, okay? Now, just in exactly the same way, when you spontaneously break a one-form symmetry, it will again have a Goldstone mode, and you can show that this Goldstone mode will be a one-form field. And actually, this it's a one-form field which is invariant under such a transformation, so a going to a plus the differential of some arbitrary function, which is you know, the gauge symmetry of, a, of, of A, the photon. So you can see very clearly that the, the Goldstone action of such a field, of the Goldstone field of broken one form symmetry is just the pure Maxwell theory, okay? It's F mu nu, F mu nu. So it's a, you know, it, it's a sort of just a higher form generalization of 
of what we know from zero form symmetry. So it's very easy to establish actually that you can think of gold of photons as of the Goldstone bosons of the broken one form U1 symmetry. Okay, so this has been sort of shown. Now, what is actually very interesting in this case is the following. So, you know, what we're most familiar with is actually not the unbroken phase, it's the broken phase. So from the point of view of this one form magnetic uh, higher form symmetry, it's really the broken phase that is most familiar to us. And it's the unbroken phase, which is very, very complicated and messy. Um, and I will be interested in that phase, okay? So that's, that, that's the plasma phase. So it's the plasma phase, which is the unbroken phase. And it's the vacuum, which is the broken phase of the symmetry. So it's a little bit strange, but you know, you, you get used to it. It's kind of the inverse of thinking. Usually things that are unbroken are simpler, but okay, that's a very sort of heuristic statement. Now, you can also, also associate a, an order parameter to such thing. So for example, for zero form symmetry, uh, the distinguishing feature going from a broken to an unbroken phase will be something like exponential decay of the correlation function to a factorization of the correlator. For one form symmetry, you can calculate things like the expectation values of, of, the, of the Wilson loop. And what you will see is that you go from an area law to perimeter law. So it's because you're dealing with these higher dimensional objects that they're kind of very analogous to what you would expect from confinement, okay? So I will not have time to discuss this, but there's a well-defined theory of all this and, and we know how this all this stuff behaves. Now, so basically the bottom line is that many, many theories that, that we know have these higher form symmetries, okay? Now, is this new? Yes, it's, in many cases, it's new. What is new is that we can think about these phases of matter and these theories from a sort of a new point of view, okay? From the point of view of a global symmetry, which is not a redundancy, okay? Now, uh, we're going to forget all about quantum gravity. So let's, you know, we'll assume that these things exist. So for example, the abelian Higgs model is one of the theories that has a, a same kind of one form, con continuous one form symmetry. Um, for example, center symmetries in non-abelian gauge theories are also higher form symmetries. They are the discrete, versions of these higher form symmetries. And then a variety of very, very interesting condensed matter systems has these types of symmetries. Now, what, one kind of example that sort of I was involved in and then was able to write the theory, something old in the new language is for example, the theory of elasticity or, or viscoelasticity. So for example, you can think of a number of lattice sites going of, of essentially lines going through, you know, lattice sites as, a kind of a one form symmetry. And it can, in a very similar way to what I'm going to do with magnetohydrodynamics, you can rephrase the theory of elasticity in this new language of higher form symmetry. So there, you know, one can do many things like this. So the bottom line is that the language and the formalism of these symmetries has actually become very well developed in the last, I don't know, let's say three, four years. Um, and there are various new concepts now associated with this endeavor that you may have heard that are becoming more or less popular and people are sort of very prolifically exploring these things. For example, the concept of a two group symmetry, which you may have heard of. Uh, recently, there's been some discussion of what are called non-invertible symmetries, which is a way of, that they're not actually symmetries because the operators are not unitary, but it's a new way of writing uh, anomalies in a language that looks like a symmetry, okay? Even though the symmetry in the old sense is broken by the anomaly. So there's a variety of very, very interesting things that are happening in this sort of more formal field of theoretical physics, exploring such symmetries. And also in particular, what is really fascinating are various applications to condensed matter systems. And now more recently also to sort of topological things like axions and, and, and various things like this. So that's the sort of my lightning overview of what these symmetries are. And now I want to sort of, you know, do something with this. So I don't want to just rephrase old things in, in a new language and make it sound fancy. What I would like to do is, you know, actually make some use of this. So what can we do with this? So magnetohydrodynamics, I claim is a very nice place where this can be done. So what is magnetohydrodynamics? So in the sort of most simple textbook form, it's a theory, it's a theory of plasma. So what is the plasma? Plasma is, you can think of it as an ionized gas. You have a gas, you ionize it. So it means that it's, you know, the whole thing is still overall neutral because you don't want it to explode, but you know, the constituents are, are now charged. So you have 
positively negatively charged constituents and they're moving around this plasma so they feel electromagnetic forces okay that's the sort of the most primitive wave that i can think of as describing what is this so you know the natural assumption what should describe such a thing well it should be something like a fluid because the stuff behaves like a gas sort of so you use navier stokes equations and the stuff is also interacting electromagnetically so you will also couple this to maxwell electromagnetism so the simplest way of doing this which is extremely useful and you know has produced many many spectacular results uh, so what do you do well you take the equations of a fluid so you take the conservation of energy i.e the continuity equation you take the conservation of momentum. Uh, I, here I write it as the Euler equation, and you couple that to an external force, right? So this is the this is essentially the equation that says F is equal to m times a. So you have conservation of momentum, and there's an external force, which is the Lorentz force J cross B. Okay. Now, if you want to add dissipative terms, then this would be something more like an obvious Stokes equation, but for purposes of this discussion, now it's perfectly okay to just think of this as an Euler equation coupled to an external force. Now, what do you do with the Maxwell part? So this is the sort of the trickier part. So we have, we know we have four Maxwell's equations. Now, the point is that in the most low energy limit of a plasma, the electric fields are screened. Okay. So what happens to photons? So photons are massive in a plasma, right? So electric fields are screened and they're much weaker than magnetic fields. So actually in this infrared limit, the electric field is not a dynamically dy dynamical variable. So, um, so out of the four equations, you sort of throw away the electric Gauss's law. You keep the magnetic Gauss's, Gauss's law because that's a constraint on the magnetic flux lines. Uh, and then you still have um, Faraday's law, which relates the curl of E to the derivative of B. And in, very, very importantly, you throw away the time derivative in Ampere's law, okay? So there's no time derivative of E because E is subleading in the sense that it's not a dynamical variable, okay? And then you sort of couple this together. You usually also use something like a version of ideal Ohm's law. So in this limit, you take the conductivity to zero. And actually this is what fixes the electric field to the magnetic field, okay? This is essentially Ohm's law, J is equal to sigma times E, you boost it. So J is equal to sigma times E plus V cross B, and then you take, you know, do you divide by sigma, take sigma to infinity, so left-hand side is zero, and that fixes E plus V cross B to be equal to zero, okay? That's the simplest thing you can do. Uh, and then you sort of need some kind of equation of state, okay? And that's, that, that's, the, that's the simplest textbook way of doing magnetohydrodynamics. Now, what we wanted to do is sort of understand this from the more fundamental point of view. And so one thing that this does, for example, it sort of mixes together the concepts of electromagnetic fields, which are microscopic, and fluid degrees of freedom, which are very macroscopic. So one question that we had was, you know, is there a way of doing this without mixing microscopic and macroscopic? And actually, most importantly, what are actually the symmetries that are underpinning this? Because as I will discuss in the next slide, you know, from this more modern point of view, hydrodynamics is all about global conserved operators. So what is going on here? Okay. And then another thing, if you really investigate these equations, it seems like it's an equation that would be very good for small magnetic fields, not particularly for large ones. Can one generalize this? And then if you look at the literature, various types of literature appear with different types of transport coefficients. So for example, in the Navier-Stokes term, uh, because well, obviously, you know, for, for different physical purposes, some are important, some are not. But you know, as a general classification question, I was wondering what is the what is the actual number of these transport coefficients, okay? Then let's say you have some kind of quantum effect, something interesting is happening to the equation of state, some kind of Euler-Heisenberg thing. Can you incorporate this into the equation of state? How do you ex extend these equations systematically, okay? So let me start with the sort of a more modern description of hydrodynamics. So what is hydrodynamics, okay, without the magneto part? So we know that, you know, in the last years, we've learned that basically hydrodynamics, well, I mean, again, people knew this before, but now it's sort of been rephrased maybe in a slightly more um, modern way. So we know that hydrodynamics is an effective theory. It's an effective low energy theory, which we know actually how to write down in the Lagrangian formalism. Uh, but actually for most of what I'll do today, this will not be important. It, what, it, what is important is it's a theory of globally conserved operators, okay? So let's say you have conserved energy momentum, then you have a conserved T mu nu. If you have some kind of conserved U1 current, then you will also have a conserved J. And then 
these conservation laws are the equations of motion of the hydrodynamic system. Okay, what governs the infrared are the conserved quantities. And then what one does is to write down the most general expansion of these conserved operators that are of interest to your physical system. So for example, what you do is you take your T mu nu, let's say, and you write it out in terms of a gradient expansion, you write down all the terms that you can, counting the number of derivatives. So why derivatives? Well, that's also an assumption. We formulate the effective theory in terms of you know, derivatives. So we assume that we're kind of close to some kind of local thermal equilibrium and the fluctuations of these fields, i.e. the velocity of your fluid and the temperature. For example, if you, if you pick temperature as a scalar with which you'll represent your you know, energy density pressure, you could, you could do any of this. We assume that the derivatives are small. And then in principle, what we're supposed to do is write down an infinite series, okay? Now, one simple thing to see why this is useful is for example, <clears throat> if you then use the equations of motion, uh, which is the conservation of T mu nu, let's say you have such a T mu nu written to all of the, you know, all the orders and derivatives, you can then plug it in and you can compute what we call dispersion relations. So what is a dispersion relation? It's a relation between frequency and wave vector Q of the modes in your theory, okay? And these things can then be expanded as a power series and powers of Q. And one way of rephrasing this gradient expansion in Fourier space is by saying that frequencies and momenta Q, i.e. wave vectors, have to be small compared to the, let's say, equilibrium temperature, which is your you know, steady state of the hydrodynamic theory, okay? Now, one important thing is that this is a sort of a systematic thing. You can do this order by order. And what we understand now is if you truncate the series at first order, i.e., well, it starts with the zeroth order, that's the Euler part, and then the first order part are the Navier-Stokes, uh, is the Navier-Stokes theory. So if you truncate this theory, you plug it into the conservation law, and then let's say you take the non-relativistic limit, you will recover the usual Navier-Stokes equation, okay? So that's sort of how it works, but you can you know, systematically study this at higher and higher orders. So just to give you, you know, what is the prediction of such a theory? Well, this theory can tell you just for standard neutral hydrodynamics, is that your transverse modes will be diffusive. So their dispersion relation looks like this and the longitudinal modes will come in pair and there'll be sound modes. So there'll be propagation of sound because it has a real part and an imaginary part. Now, of course, you know this is an effective theory. So what this theory cannot tell you is what is the speed of sound? So you need to supply it with some kind of microscopic information, i.e. you have to give it the equation of state and the transport coefficients from some microscopic calculation. Now. What is then magnetohydrodynamics at this level of discussion? So as I already said, plasma can be thought of as the phase with an unbroken one-form symmetry. It's the magnetic one-form symmetry, okay? And this is because in the plasma phase, for example, we know that there are no massless infrared photons, okay? There's the by screening, electric fields are screened. So this phase isn't, you know, the symmetry is not broken. There are no massless photons. There are no Goldstone modes. So actually, you know, regardless, there is a two-form current, J mu nu, which is conserved just because of the presence of this magnetic one-form symmetry. And this is the word identity for the operator that I'll be interested in. Now, the point is that because now I'm working in a phase, you know, which is, which contains whatever, an infinite number of excitations, including massive photons, it's very, very hard to write an effective theory of such a thing. Uh, in terms of, for example, a mu nu, sorry, a mu, which is the photon field. So the point is that here, we would like to now take this existence of a one form symmetry seriously and just use j mu nu in the same way that you use j mu here and t mu nu and write it out in the, you know, the language of hydrodynamics that we have learned and developed over the last, I don't know, decades. Uh, maybe centuries. <laughs> it depends on where you start counting. So, what is magnetohydrodynamics? Well, magnetohydrodynamics in this language is a hydrodynamic infrared theory with the following conservation laws. So, it has conserved energy and momentum. So, T mu nu is conserved. And it also has a one form symmetry with a two form current, J mu nu, which is conserved. Okay. And this counts the number of flux lines crossing a surface. Okay. So, if you like this J mu nu at the end of the day, can be converted into electric and magnetic fields by definition in terms of F mu nu, all right? And this allows you to convert everything back. Now, what you do is, as I said, you can take Pavel's lecture notes, uh, 
and you could just follow them and you do the same thing. So this is what we did in 2017. Uh, and we wrote down a hydrodynamic theory for such uh, operators, okay? We wrote down the most general constitutive relations and you know, I'm not going to write them out because in principle, it's a you know, programmatic thing you can do. Uh, you can also do it from the point of view of an effective field theory in the schwinger keldish contour. This is something that we've developed more recently, but for the purposes of this, this is not necessary. You just do the general thing and you come up with a theory and you, well, we stopped at first order so that you know, we're at the level of Nadir Stokes equations. It's a relativistic full MHD theory, but it also has dissipation. Now, so what is the point? The point is that absolutely no assumption goes into this. So for example, one thing is that you can supply such a theory with any, absolutely any equation of state. You, let's say your pressure is an arbitrary function of the magnetic field and the temperature, well, you can just plug it in and it will give you predictions for that theory. It also tells you how many transport coefficients there are. So there are uh, two plus three viscosities uh, and two resistivities. And then if you also impose positivity of the entropy production, they will give you some interesting inequalities in particular, you know, these uh, viscosities. So there are two shear viscosities, uh, eta perpendicular, eta parallel with respect to the background magnetic field. There are two resistivities, these Rs, one is perpendicular, one per, uh, parallel with respect to the magnetic field and they have to be positive, much like in standard hydrodynamics. And you also find an interesting sort of inequality uh, between three bulk viscosities in this system, which I will somewhat address later. Okay, so you get the result. Another sort of interesting thing of this is that, let's say, you know, you compute from QED, your viscosities and resistivities, they can also be arbitrary functions of the magnetic field and temperature, and you can just plug it in and you will have some, you know, horrendous set of partial differential equations, which then you can model. And that's the theory. That's the theory of magnetohydrodynamics. So, for example, what you see here very clearly is that the electric field is induced at the derivative level, okay? So in the, in the background, as it should be, there's no electric field, it's one derivative suppressed. So it's generated by dissipative corrections, i.e. by resistive terms, okay? This you can see. Now, Question. what can you, yeah, please, yeah. Uh, just making sure that I didn't misunderstand. <laughs> uh, what about the zero form symmetry? Did you just drop the charge conservation? Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. So this is, um, you can you can put it in if you want. We, we also did that in the paper. Let's say you have something like baryon number conservation, right? You, you can also add that. We did that already in the original paper. Uh, but, you know, for, for sort of simple uh, plasma, which is neutral in the background, this is, this is a perfectly good description of what I'm doing right now. Yeah. The reason I'm asking is that if you do introduce resistivities, it seems like the currents are unavoidable and they should be conserved. The, the, um, the electromagnetic currents. Yes. Yeah, I think this is all there. This is all in this description. So basically everything that is here is also here. You can compute everything out of that. Everything is sort of hidden inside of these variables. But without can, the need of the third equation in the middle, you have the box with the yeah. two equation, but you exactly. don't need the third one for some reason. No, you don't. Yeah, you don't need anything extra because you know the, the variables are the, the variables are the fluid variables, i.e., the like the velocity and the temperature. And then there's some auxiliary variables associated with these flux lines. And then everything you're interested in, you can compute out of this formula. You can compute the electric field. You can also put it in an external field if you like. You can do all of this. There's no everything is, you know, basically all of the all of the stuff that one had to solve for before or throw away by, by phenomenological reasons has already happened automatically. And you don't have to do anything. It's all just there. It's just MHD. Okay, okay. I, I, I suppose it's sort of the same as the regular uh, four <coughs> Maxwell equations. They automatically give you the conservation of the charge. So essentially, exactly. effectively, it's included. I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all there. It's all just there. Yeah. And also the fact that, yeah, so basically you can think of this conservation, a simple way of thinking of this equation. If I set nu to zero, that's kind of like magnetic Gauss's law. And the one with the spatial component I here is like Faraday's law, because these are the, yeah, so that one is the constraint on the fluxes and the other one is the dynamics of the fluxes. And then everything else, how electric field appears in this, how the current appears in this, all of this is already solved for. 
like the fact that J is, you know, nabla cross B and all of this is already incorporated inside of it once you calculate the electric field. And if you want to convert the right hand side into J, then it will just already obey all of those equations here. Okay. That, that makes sense, I think. Yeah. Yeah. This is how it happens. Uh, yeah. Sasha, just to understand if you if you have like pair production, uh, this breaks down, right? Some of this um, breaks down. I think, well, well okay. So pair production. So for example, you could plug in the equation of state with higher Euler-Heisenberg terms that you could do. Uh, now, of course, yeah, if you have production that then creates strong electric fields or something, then this breaks down, yeah. And in so you medium, have to stay within the right. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't have to be ultra relativistic pair production. If you have like a neutral polarizable medium, then mm -hmm. something similar would happen. Yeah, the polarizable medium, I think that can sit in the equation of state. Okay. That's okay. Okay, thanks. Yeah, that that I yeah, that I know how to incorporate. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Thanks for the questions to clarify this so we don't go through too fast. Um so basically, you know, what <clears throat> what you can look at, for example, are the dispersion relations of these modes. Now, of course. To do this precisely, you need to know the equation of state and you need to know how viscosity behaves as a function of temperature and magnetic field. But you can also look at this sort of phenomenologically. And actually what we see, and I will sort of stress this a few more times, if you go to the limit of small magnetic fields compared to the temperature, what you find are the speeds of waves which are sort of represented in any textbook. These are, you know, so what are these waves? So you have Alphen modes and you have two, types of magnetosonic modes in this theory. And they have some kind of speed of propagation as a function of theta, where theta is the angle between the momentum and the magnetic field. Okay, this is kind of the main textbooks, things are represented this way. So you can also take this, you know, general dispersion relation and you can take it to high magnetic field. And in general, things will start looking like this. So for example, the behavior of the alpha mode, the speed of the alpha mode starts looking very different as a function of the angle. So these are sort of, you know, general qualitative predictions that one can get from the form of equations. Another thing that you get are direct Kubo formulae, which I think is very interesting for resistivities. So you don't compute conductivities and then in some way, usually in this way, convert them to resistivities, you get a direct Kubo formula in terms of the two form currents. Actually, you can write this in terms of electric fields. You, you get a direct Kubo formula for the resistivities. And that's actually something that we're looking at now with my PhD student in Edinburgh, um, whether this relation between resistivity and conductivity is always correct. I mean, I know this sounds sort of insane because this is kind of a definition of resistivity and conductivity, but if you take the Kubo results seriously and the quantum field theory structure, the question is, does this still persist? Is R, the resistivity, still one over the conductivity in all cases, okay? So we have a proof of, of the DC limit using quantum field theory and things like this, but this is sort of still work in progress. So I will not talk about this. Now, what you can do with this formalism is you can go crazy and you can take temperature to zero. So we were able to show already in these, this, the first paper that the <coughs> zero temperature limit has a universal sort of uh, limit. <clears throat> so this is equivalent to looking at you know infinite magnetic field compared to very, very small temperature. And the reason for this is that there's an enhancement. So there's a, a new emergent boost symmetry along the flux lines. And this gives you all sorts of predictions. For example, it tells you that anything dissipative must vanish. Uh, one interesting, very, very simple prediction is it tells you that the alpha waves in this limit have a completely universal dispersion relation. So omega must be equal to plus minus k times cosine theta, okay? And so it's an immediate prediction. Now. What is good about these things is that, you know, it, it's a kind of an all-encompassing theory which you can expand in different limits. So various old things that we know and love are limits of this description. So for example, let, let, let me start here. So if you take the equation of state and you expand it out in small uh, magnetic field compared to the temperature, so that, you know, temperature is the leading term, and then you have some second term. So it's, it's a series in B over T, i.e. the old low, low magnetic field limit. For example, what you can show is that if you truncate here at first order in the expansion, then this will give you the textbook MHD. 
but you don't have to do this. You could have higher order terms in magnetic fields, and you can even you know, generate some kind of non-relativistic limit. Basically, there's a systematic way of expanding this stuff out and getting the modifications to the old MHD equations in you know, whatever language you would like them. So that's something that you can do. The point being here is that you can really show that old MHD equations are essentially the low magnetic field limit of the generalized equations. Now, the other is this extreme limit that I told you about. So taking zero temperature or extreme magnetic field is the same. So the theory also reduces by this you know, enhancement of the symmetry that I told you. So what is very interesting is that you can show that this is also an effective theory for massless Landau levels. So you take a fermion, you put it in an extremely strong magnetic field, you know, it will quanta. So basically everything will be populated in the lowest Landau level. Then you can use bosonization and you can show that this theory is equivalent. So you can actually think of such a, you know, Landau level physics as of fermion modes living on different one dimensional strings. So this has been done. You can also show that this limit is actually equivalent to the force free limit of electrodynamics. This was shown first by uh, Glorioso and Son in a paper, and then in some follow up papers, this was developed. So basically, this extreme limit is the force free electrodynamics. And for those who don't know what this is, it's essentially in the simplest incarnation, it's the Maxwell's equations plus a constraint that E dot B is zero. And somehow, remarkably, you can do this uh, consistently in any frame. Uh, but you know, this sort of formalism also allows you then to build corrections on top of this. Now, so that's the old story. We have a sort of a general theory of magnetohydrodynamics. Now, what we would like to do is, of course, understand how these things actually behave. So before we do this, you know, it's very, very hard, of course, anyone knows this, to compute the equation of state, let's say of QCD, that depends on the magnetic field. What is the dependence of the magnetic field? So the first thing for someone like me to do is to well build a holographic dual, okay? Because at least with holography, we have something that we can do. So this is what we did in, in 2017, shortly after the original paper came out. So we actually built a holographic dual. So, you know, sort of a lightning uh, description of what this is. So what is holography? Well, holography is a, is a duality between some kind of four dimensional quantum field theories and higher dimensional gravity, okay? And in the simplest limit, these quantum field theories are large n limits, typically at very, very strong coupling. And in this limit, you know, such theories are fairly easy to study from the classical gravity point of view in five dimension. Okay. So I don't have time to go into the details, but the point is that we were able to construct the holographic dual of such a thing. So what is it? Actually, once you know what the global symmetries are, it, well, it's pretty easy because you just know that you will have energy momentum that's conserved. So there's a T mu nu. So there has to be gravity. There's dynamical gravity that can source energy and momentum. And similarly, you have a two form current J. So you introduce also a two form field into the bulk, call it B mu nu, with some uh, three form uh, H, H is equal to dB. This is the field strength of the two form field in 5D. And you write down the simplest theory, okay? And then basically sort of all of the devil is in the details of this. You have to impose mixed boundary conditions. It's a little bit complicated, but then you can actually, you can really convince yourself that this is essentially a, a holographic theory of a plasma, something like N equals to four super young mills, where one of the currents, the, in this case, it's a U1 subgroup of the R symmetry current is gauged. So you see that, you know, by doing this procedure, you really get dynamical electromagnetism on the boundary. And then you can go to a background with a magnetic black hole. So a black hole has finite temperature, it has finite background magnetic field, and you can study this using, using standard holographic techniques. Now, why is this good? Well, it's good because you can calculate stuff. So you can calculate the equation of state and you can see, for example, we did this. So this is the energy density, pressure, entropy density, and the one form charge as a function of the magnetic field. So it's T over square root of B, okay? <laughs> That's the dimensional ratio, sorry, dimensionless ratio. And you can calculate the dependence of the equation of state of this holographic plasma on this ratio. You can also calculate the dependence of all of the transport coefficients. And indeed, you know, we did this, you can calculate the dependence of all seven transport coefficients on T over square root of B, and you see how they behave. So in particular, they have some sort of interesting feature so indeed, actually, we had the general prediction that all of these transport coefficients must vanish at t is equal to zero based just on symmetry arguments. And that 
was verified. <clears throat> so we can verify this from a direct holographic calculation. What is actually interesting are particularly resistivities. So, you know, at small temperature compared to magnetic field, our theory predicts that they all have to be zero. Whereas sort of phenomenological considerations of standard MHD say that, you know, when you have standard MHD, it's the conductivity, which is huge. So that also means that in the standard limit of MHD, which is actually large temperature compared to magnetic field, the resistivity should also go to zero. And you do see this. So this implies that, you know, there's some value of maximal resistivity at roughly intermediate magnetic field. Another interesting feature is this inequality on the bulk viscosities. So holography again saturates this inequality that I showed you earlier that is derived from entropy production. And this is kind of, it's, it's, it's sort of a usual thing that holographic theories like to do. In a sense, I think what's going on is that these holographic strongly coupled theories like to minimize entropy. So this is in some sense quite equivalent to the Kofton sun starry nets, eta over s. It's fairly equivalent also to a second order hydrodynamic relation called the hot Rom relation and so on. I, I don't have time to, to discuss this, but it is fairly interesting that again, holography likes to saturate all these bounds, okay? So we do find this explicitly for the holographic theory. Now, what you can also do with holography, and I will not have time to discuss this at all, holography is, you know, holographic theory goes all the way from infrared to the ultraviolet. So it goes beyond MHD. And you can actually discuss now, you know, things like screening of photons. You can include dynamical electric fields by just looking at the full holographic theory. Okay, so this is kind of in the framework of these theories that we like to call quasi hydrodynamics, which means that you know, it's a hydrodynamic theory plus other stuff. And this other stuff can also be long lived. So for example, um, photons can also be long lived and they can start interacting with the hydrodynamic modes. You can study how the alpha waves interact with these dressed photons and so on. You could do these all sorts of things from holography just using the same model. And we have done some of that, but you know, more is to be sort of observed. So for example, what you see directly is that holography is able to give you kinetic terms to the electric field. So you're able to also look at dynamics of the electric field should you wish to. Uh, another interesting observation I think is that once you add dynamical electric fields, the theory formally speaking has the structure of this Israel Stewart theory. You can understand the theory as having this, you know, JMU nu, the two form current, which has the ideal part plus the dissipative part, which becomes a dynamical variable. And you give it some kinetic term, and you can see that these equations are really have the structure of MIS theory. Okay, this is maybe more of a comment for experts on this. Uh, what is mainly important here is that we also have a holographic sort of description where we can go beyond the MHD limit. Whereas, you know, going beyond the MHD limit, just from the pure, purely point of view of effective field theory is very difficult. Okay. Okay. So, you know, given that we like to study things like plasma instabilities. Plasma instabilities often require the dynamics of strong electric fields. I believe that this can be used in the future. Now, let me not go on about this. I will very briefly tell you about our last application of all of this formalism, which is to neutron stars, okay? So the question, the natural question is, okay, we have a formalism. It's, you know, very nice. Um, you can do things with it. Is it useful, okay? Are there actual effects? in nature, which you know can be described by this formalism with new sort of additions to the old story of MHD, which maybe were overlooked or maybe were not important for people who were you know thinking about them. Can you do something? So we believe that we have a sort of a nice new application, which appeared in this paper with the MIT group still at the time. Well, out of the four of us, only Hong Liu is still at MIT. Uh, all of the other ones have left, but there's a paper that appeared in 2022 and there's going to be an another one in 2023. And the application we believe, the simplest application of this type is magnetic diffusion in, the, in neutron stars. So, okay, so we know that neutron stars have very, very strong magnetic fields. Many very interesting colloquia are in the series have been given on neutron stars, including many that I watched when I was actually trying to learn about magnetars. And <laughs> so it's been extremely useful also for me, just to learn this field. And so there's the point is that there's an old theory of magnetic diffusion, which goes by the name of Goldreich and Reisenegger. It's a theory from 1992. So I will tell you what this theory is. And then I will tell you what we think we can do 
that supplements that theory and improves it in particular for regimes of strong magnetic field, okay? Using the language that I was using. So very briefly, for someone like me, what is a neutron star? Well, it's a, <laughs> it's a soup of three types of particles, okay? This is a very, very simple picture of a neutron star, the most primitive level possible. So you have a, a soup of neutrons, electrons, and protons. And you know, the first order in approximation, it's really the neutrons that are the really heavy ones. And then you have a, an approximately neutral uh, plasma made of electrons and protons that are sort of swimming around, okay? So I'm actually, if you look at this original theory of, of the dynamics of magnetic field, this is actually exactly what they do. So they write down the kind of equations that I wrote down. So basically they write down Euler equations and continuity equations for each of these types of, <clears throat> of, 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 of components. It's kind of like a three component fluid. And of course, they can also collide. So each one has some kind of relaxation time for different collisions, collisions between electrons, positrons, sorry, <laughs> electrons, protons, and neutrons, and so on, okay? What is also important is the inverse beta decay. So one, for example, these weak interactions are in accounted for, and they're used to sort of, you know, uh, cause some kind of change in the in the chemical potentials, I don't have time to go through the details. It's a you know it's a paper from 1992. It's very famous in the in this community. It's a very beautiful paper. The result is this: they get an evolution equation of the magnetic field. Basically, everything else is suppressed. So the magnetic field evolution equation has some you know time derivative of v, and then it has a right hand side, and this right hand side has three terms. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I will discuss uh, these, these these things in sort of more details. So basically, there are three terms. There's a there's a term with j, and then there are various, you know, there's a there's some velocity v cross b and j cross b term. Okay, and some curls and you know, vector calculus kind of stuff. What is really beautiful about this model is that it does have, you know, it's a sort of a microscopic model in the sense that the coefficients have some meaning. So you know, there's some sigma, the conductivity, which is computed in terms of the uh, proton mass, effective electron mass, and some relaxation times of, of the collisions. You can also calculate you know, uh, these, this kind of velocity and so on. So there are three terms and each one has a different meaning, which I'll now discuss. And this is the theory, okay? Now, usually, of course, these coefficients are taken to be constant, as far as I know, maybe somebody has looked at them, not as constant, but I, I think at least in the original paper, uh, things like conductivities were taken to be constant in, in space time, okay? So, so what are these three terms, okay? So this is a sort of a, it's a phenomenological theory. It's kind of, you know, it's, a, it's exactly very similar to the usual magnetohydrodynamic things. So it's phenomenological from one point of view, it's microscopic from another point of view because it gives you coefficients as actual, you know, depending on microscopic variables. But the point is it has the following form and that's sort of all you need to remember. So. What are these equations? Well, there's Gauss's law, which is the constraint on the magnetic field. And then there's Faraday's law, okay? So there's the magnetic field, which is evolving, and it's equal to minus curl of E. And then, you know, the, all of the theory is in calculating this induced electric field from the dynamics. So it has three terms, which I already told you. The first term is the standard diffusive term. This is literally the most standard diffusion you can have. The other two terms are interesting. So there's a something that looks like J cross B cross B, which is called an ambipolar diffusion term. It has various phenomenological, you know, very interesting effects. But this is what it looks like. Uh, it's J cross B cross B, and J is, you know, it, it's the curl of B. And there's a, uh, so basically what ambipolar diffusion does, it induces things like anisotropies and, you know, various interesting things. Uh, and the third term is called the Hall drift term. It's just J cross B. So this term is kind of like a Hall term in the sense that it does various interesting things to the di dispersion relation. For example, what it does, it makes the diffusion constant complex. So it has both, uh, the diffusion is both relaxing and also propagating. So the point is that each of these coefficients in the old incarnation at least was a constant, okay? And there are these three phenomenological terms that do different things that have been discussed at length in the history. Now, what we claim is that if, you do MHD in this new way and you just really write everything down. Um, so you write down the most general effective theory, which is what we actually do, or you could also do it at the level of constitutive relations. Uh, the crucial ingredient compared to what I was talking about yesterday, sorry, not yesterday, earlier in the earlier section, 
is the fact that you have to include broken charge invariants. So at this level of the theory, charge conjugation invariance is broken by the fact that, you know, there are electrons and protons, there are no positrons and antiprotons. So this effectively breaks charge conjugation invariance. And that's what we do. So we generalize what we did in the past. We look at this probe limit in which the fluctuations of the energy momentum tensor are negligible. So you find, again, a diffusion equation uh, that has the same form as before. So there's the Gauss's law and there's Faraday's law. What is new now is that the electric field which is induced is more general, okay? So it has all the three terms that you had before. There's the standard ohmic diffusive term, which just gives you standard diffusion, but the coefficient can be an arbitrary function of the magnetic field and temperature. There's the ambipolar term. Again, the coefficient can be an arbitrary function. There are some constraints between them, but let's say, you know, they can be very general functions. And there's the ambipolar term, uh, sorry, the, the whole term that I discussed earlier. Now, what is new is the second one. So you also get a series of <clears throat> new terms, which are actually interestingly of the same order. So these are the terms that come from the magnetic field dependence of the equation of state. I, I will tell you more about this, but the point is that even if the, these coefficients are constants, you still have new terms. These terms are not suppressed by anything. They're you know, at the same order of B as before, and they're not suppressed by any more derivatives. So you have new terms. And then once you have this theory, you can, you know, <clears throat> also compute all of the correlation functions of magnetic and electric fields. So now I want to just spend a few more minutes on the interpretation of this. So what, what are these things? So what, what is new, okay? So what is new is exactly the fact that our theory allows for arbitrary magnetic field dependence of things like the magnetic susceptibility, okay? I.e. the equation of state. So there are two magnetic susceptibilities in this theory, chi perpendicular and chi parallel with respect to the magnetic field. And the point is that they don't have to be the same, okay? They're both computed from one function, A. So everything depends on the scalar function A, which is a function of an arbitrary function of B squared. And only for very, very special functions, A, are these two susceptibilities equal to each other? So my, my favorite way of thinking about this is the following. So let's say you, you put background magnetic field in the Z direction and you calculate the two point function of BZ, BZ. You look at the Kubo formula. So you look, you take the uh, zero omega, zero K limit of this correlator. You can call this chi parallel. Right? You can now take the perpendicular magnetic field and you can compute the two point function, take the Kubo limit and you will get chi perpendicular. So basically in the goldreich reisenegger theory, has both of these equal to each other, okay? So in the background, in the most infrared limit, the correlator between perpendicular and parallel magnetic fields are equal to each other. It's not obvious, this is not put in, but this is just, you know, somehow what the theory says at the end of the day. But what our theory allows is for this to not be the case. And now, then you can also go and you can calculate dissipative terms. So what I wanted to show you here is, well, is it, Right, so the question is how big are these effects? How big is the dependence of the magnetic field? Uh, so one place where I can do it so far is again holography, right? This is our friend. So you can calculate indeed uh, the ratio between chi parallel and chi perpendicular as a function of the magnetic field. And you see, as you would expect, at zero magnetic field, it's one, the ratio is one. But as soon as you, know, you vary the strength of the magnetic field in the background, it's no longer one. So there are two different curves. They correspond to different strengths of the electric charge. It's not important. What is important is that they are not one, okay? So there are physical, qualitative, and quantitative effects which will enter into these terms. So these new terms will not be zero. What remains to be answered is how big they are for actual physical things, okay? For physical neutron stars. Uh, so before I get, I, I guess I won't have anything to say about this yet, but the point is that we have new equations and you know, there are new terms which this theory predicts. So another simple prediction is for example, the dispersion relation. So you can calculate the dispersion relation of these diffusive modes. And you know, it's also different to, uh, to the best of my knowledge, anything that appeared in the literature before, exactly again, 
because these chi's are not the same, all right? They're different from each other. So therefore you, you get you know, qualitatively different behavior. These are some plots of the real and imaginary part as a function of the magnetic field, some you know, phenomenologically parameterized equation of states. And you see that, for example, you know, the speeds of course, and the dissipative rate of diffusion changes as a function of the magnetic field. Okay, good. So that's all I had to say. Now, let me just conclude with a few thoughts. So hopefully what you know, I was trying to show you today is that these sort of seemingly formal approaches to quantum field theories, i.e. sort of a formalization of the concept of global symmetries, I believe is useful for actual physical insight into realistic states of matter, okay? So, you know, if you were just to say, well, we can say we just have a theory with a one from symmetry, which means that, you know, there's some kind of conserved number of strings in the thing. What we wrote down is just a general theory of string fluids, okay? And plasma, i.e. magnetohydrodynamics, is one class of these theories, you know, which I guess all belong in some, some I don't know, description of what we can call string fluids. Now, these higher form symmetries and also new developments in the language of effective field theories then allowed us to write down what I would call, to the best of my knowledge, a general formulation of magnetohydrodynamics, which is applicable for any equation of state, i.e. you can plug in any function of the magnetic field, even an arbitrarily infinitely strong magnetic field. And as I showed you, even for, you know, infinitely strong magnetic fields compared to the temperature, we have some new universal predictions. So actually the theory in many ways becomes simpler for high magnetic fields. That's I think one of the take homes from this. So, all right, so we have a new sort of new equation uh, which you know we believe should be useful to the theory of neutron stars, i.e. we have a new theory of magnetic diffusion, new from the point of view that, well, the, the set of you know, partial differential equations that you have to solve at the end has new terms, okay? That's what I mean by new. So there are terms which we claim are can be order one compared to the other ones, which augment the differential equations that have been studied. And you know, uh, it's to be seen how large these effects are. So obviously what has to be done next, uh, ideally it's by somebody who can do it, which is you know, the set of people who can do this uh, does not include myself. And it's the nonlinear evolution of these equations. These are very, very complicated coupled partial differential equations. You know, there are experts who, who study, for example, um, plasma turbulence and things like this. So one of the important questions is what are the new effects of this equation? Are there any? This is to be seen. Uh, we could also, you know, another thing to do is to include various other things into these equations. For example, superfluidity, which, you know, may very realistically be important for the dynamics of neutron stars. And then I think the last, maybe sort of a very important question for me that I'm trying to answer this is just simply how large are these effects? Okay, we have some equations, some new terms, how big are they? So finally, now we are making some progress talking to people who are actually able to calculate the equation of state. So, you know, at, as the first approximation, what do you have to do? Well, you have to estimate what is the magnetic field dependence of the neutron star. Once you have the equation of state, let's say you have pressure as a function of the magnetic field, then I can immediately calculate this A and ideally with some numbers outside, we'll be able to estimate how large are these effects compared to the other terms which already exist which can be you know, very nicely estimated from the goldreich reisenegger theory in terms of things like electron mass and things like that. So you know, this is to be done, it's work in progress um, and we'll, we'll see where this goes. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, thank you for a very nice presentation and now we'll have some uh, time for questions. So who has a uh, question, please raise the hand. Uh, Giorgio Torrieri, go ahead. Hi, um, thanks for a great talk. I'll ask a general thing and a particular example just to, so the general thing is, um, does <clears throat> this give you, I mean, are higher form symmetries able to give you something that you would have no chance of getting from like a boring gradient expansion or something like that? Or is it a more elegant and a more concise way to get an effective theory out that, and as a particular, just as a particular example, which might be able to sort of answer the question is, 
you have this magnetic diffusion. Do you think there will be a vortical diffusion in a fluid with vorticity and spin, um, which will have a parallel dynamic to the magnetic field? Uh, sort of because in an effective theory, most likely yes, <laughs> for obvious <for> reasons. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Th thanks, Giorgio. Um, yeah, these are very these are difficult questions. I I would say, um, I. I think, well, certainly it's a more concise and simpler way of writing things down, which makes it harder to forget stuff. <laughs> I think that's maybe that's, it's most that's important. important. Yeah, I think <laughs> it's very important. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, and also, I mean, it, you know, so it doesn't really involve any discussion of really electric and magnetic fields, you just write down and, you know, you still use gradient expansion. So that, that, that you know, to sort of answer the part of your question that you don't go away from this. Well, in holography, you could go away from it, but, but you know, from, from the hydro point of view, you still use it. So I think it's, a, I, I don't know. I, I mean, I would say we have found new things, which I guess people could have found in a different language. Uh, yeah, why not? Um, yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't, it's very hard to answer this question. So one, maybe what is interesting is the question of variables, actually. So, you know, you, do, do you see my, do you still see my slides? Yes. Yep. You do. Okay. So basically, um, <clears throat> so we write down this theory in terms of some auxiliary variables. Uh, here I'm calling them G. Okay. So there's J written in terms of G and its derivatives. It's a gradient expansion and G is some auxiliary variable. So it seems, I would say that actually you can do the evolution equation directly in terms of these variables. There's nothing preventing you from just solving the PDEs in terms of these auxiliary variables. Then you calculate what they are. And then at the end of the day, you convert all of this into one, two, whatever point functions of electric and magnetic fields. And actually, this conversion from one to another is, yeah, it, I mean, you can always do it one way. I don't know. It's maybe it's possible that it's not always invertible from one to another. So I, I would even say that, you know, our point of view in the last year has been that maybe these auxiliary variables are actually the right variables to work on. Now, what does right mean? I think they're certainly more convenient are there some effects that you couldn't see otherwise? I don't know, I, I cannot point to one, but I would say that one of the nice features of this formalism is that you can solve things in a different language in terms of different you know, auxiliary variables, which I think are better suited. So, you know, why is it better suited? It's because you know, there's no massless gauge field in this, in this phase. So you just have these auxiliary fields, which somehow just swallow all of these problems and they don't care. Just do it. So, yeah. Um, but I, yeah, it, it, it's hard. Maybe it's just rewriting in a way that prevents me from forgetting. But you know, there might be more capable people who are very happy with dealing with vector calculus, and they never forget. You know, the curl of a curl of a b cross b cross b dot b dot. You know, it's it's a horrendous mess. I mean, <laughs> if you open a magneto hydrodynamics book, it's it's it's. I mean, the the amount of of, of triangles and squares and and you know crosses and dots is terrifying. <laughs> this is this is much easier, I, I think, at least for me. Yeah. So um, yeah, I think it's definitely more convenient. Is it? Is it? I don't dare to claim that it's absolutely impossible to get these effects in any other way. I would not dare to claim this. Maybe. And I don't know. I I I don't. I'm not sure what to say about the vortical question. Um, yeah, I, I, so you want MHD with like extra vortical effects, or I think that would be included here. No, no, uh, what I, would mean, not... I mean, I mean, there is no magnetic field, but there is vorticity and there is a polarization density, and the two, mm -hmm. they like you know, like lambda polarization and star. Yeah, 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 yeah and yeah, yeah, the yeah. two couple. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I so I don't that. know. Yeah. I don't. I don't know. I mean, I. I don't know if the higher form language is useful for this. It's that. Yeah. I, I. I. don't know. Maybe. The, maybe. Yeah. Because of course the equation for vorticity is not Maxwell's equations. There is no. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. I see. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Let's move on. Cindy, please. Uh, hi there, hi, Sasha. Cindy. Thank you for the nice talk. Hey, hey. Good to see you. Um. <clears throat> so. 
I don't have a perfectly well formed question here, but I wanted to ask a little bit about uh, what lessons we can draw for more general cases where we use effective field theory, given the new advances that you've that you've told us about here as in uh, You've used some new new ways of thinking about effective field theory to come up with a perhaps uh, more broadly applicable set of equations. Are there other cases where we should be looking for the same kind of thing? Hmm. Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, I think so. So I mean, I gave this very just one slide, for example, the theory of elasticity. This has been sort of uh, other people took this uh, paper that I wrote with Nick Pavutikol, and they really classified all possible theories of viscoelasticity. Uh, I, 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 there's this paper by by um, Armas and Jane. Where there's a very beautiful paper where they classify all sorts of possible theories of viscoelasticity using this language. Uh, so I think that's been useful there. Uh, people talk about fractons these days because there's some duality between fractons and, and elasticity. They talk about this in this higher form language. So I think, yeah, I, I think what is just useful is, you know, taking the fact that there's a global symmetry seriously. That's not just, you know, something that, 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 is somehow hidden in the microscopic description. You just, from the point of view of effective field theory, you take it seriously. It's there, and you you can just use it, and then you impose it. And you know, I think it it is helpful. It's a it's a helpful way of organizing things. If nothing else, it sort of goes beyond. I, 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 maybe maybe it doesn't go beyond the Landau paradigm. Maybe it just you know supplements the usual Landau paradigm of effective field theories with these extra objects that you can now play with. And so, yeah, you hope to find new things. And I think we have found some new things. Um, although maybe there has not been some smoking gun saying, you know, the neutron star will explode in 3.5 seconds and you look at it <laughs> and it does. That's still missing, <laughs> but yeah. you know, one, so, one can be hopeful. Let me, let me follow up a little bit. Uh, I just wanted yeah. to ask, of course, uh, taking these global symmetries seriously is useful, but uh, what about problems within quantum gravity where I might not think that they're really around except in some effective way? Yeah, I, uh, I, I don't know what it can teach us about quantum gravity. It's unclear to me, I would say. I mean, people have discussed also the non-existence of these things in, in the context of ADS-CFT. For example, this paper by Harlow and Noguri. Um, um, so yeah, people people have looked at this, and you know, I I I don't know if if there's also some recent work by by Diego Hoffman also and collaborators, maybe trying to understand the the graviton from this point of view. Um, yeah, I I I I'm not sure exactly what we can do for the moment for for gravity. I I, I don't know. I don't know what, you know, again, in, in this you know, large N sort of uh, classical gravity limit for holography, it is useful. It really helps you build holographic models that, that we, you know, explicitly has been shown. Uh, but quantum gravity, is this going to be helpful? My, my feeling is no, but I don't know. I don't know. And people now, you know, for example, they, they wrote down some effective theories using these, what they call non-invertible symmetries. Uh, so, for example, one can rephrase the triangle anomaly in this language. You can try to do anomalous hydrodynamics in this language. You can fix some pion uh, decay rate, for, you know, from like the axionic kind of action from this. Um, so again, you know, these are not new results. I mean, they're they're rephrased all results in terms of a new language. Maybe in some corners there are new results. Uh, it's to be seen. It's to be seen. It's a you know it's a new set of tools to play with. And, you know I, I have mainly been interested in this MHD because I, I think I think that, that we can say something new. Um, yeah, it's to be seen where this will go. Thank you. Um, let's go uh, to the next question, Armin. Please. Yes. Um, thank you. Um, I have a naive question. This. Um, if you have a homogeneous magnetic field, these new terms will disappear or not? No. Uh, where would they so, disappear? So th then I don't read this correctly. Are there gradients involved? Or are, this, are these terms under gradient or not? So uh, do, you, do, you, do you mean this slide? 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. The second line for the electric field. So you take a gradient uh -huh. of the of the field, or what are you doing? No, a, a, I... so, <clears throat> so a is some function. Oh. Uh, a is a is essentially a function parameterizing the equation of state. Oh, okay, that's that. Okay, that's a as a function of b squared. Okay, okay. exactly. Mm -hmm. And yeah, b is I, a vector, okay. so it's a function of b squared because that's a scalar. No, no, yeah, I, maybe. I maybe. thought it's just a multiplication. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, okay. no. Yeah, 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 exactly. It's okay, a function. Good. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Good. Mm -hmm. Sorry for any confusion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any other questions from the audience? I have a simple question, actually, maybe naive. Uh, the, the question relates to the possibility of inducing local non-zero charge density in the plasma. Mm -hmm. uh, that would, of course, might be penalized by the energy, I'm not sure, but effectively that means as soon as that happens, you absolutely have to take into account the usual Gauss's law for the electrical field and uh, your equations do not seem to allow that. Uh, is that right? And uh, what kind of physics you are missing, especially in the limits when you have dilute plasma? I think in that case, it's critical. Mm -hmm. Yes, so, right, these equations don't allow this because these are really, these are, you know, these are what I would call MHD in the sense that in the background, there, there's no large electric field. Neither, in the background, the electric field is zero, but it's it's, you know, as things are fluctuating, it's induced. So, you know, if you put in a huge amount of, or some kind of amount of charge density, of course, this will create electric fields. Uh, and yeah, so this would not be explained by this. So what would explain this is, is this kind of a theory. So something where the electric field becomes an independent variable. Now the electric field induces magnetic field and vice versa, and it, starts having dynamics. Now, as far as I know, so people usually address these kinds of questions maybe from more from kinetic theory, you know, like loss of equation, this, yes. this kind of context. So I think <clears throat> in this case, what I can say is that holography can tell you what the equation of motion should be, okay? So it will give you, so holography, if you take it seriously, you can go, to this limit, you, you can go to, to, you know, to basically looking at the probe limit and you can look at what the terms with dynamical electric field would be. And you could, I, I believe in from holography and you know, it's, it's just the holography will tell you the structure of these equations. You don't have to take the, the coefficient seriously because it's a different theory, but the structure of the, of the equation of motion will be I believe equivalent to what you would want. So this is certainly something of the type of question I would like to consider in the future, just because you know writing down an effective theory with dynamical electric field is, is, is difficult because you know the gradient essentially gradient expansion fails. And then then you know what do you do? How do you organize the theory? So I do believe that actually holography can be helpful for this because it contains this information. Right. And maybe, you know, maybe if the injection of the charge is sufficiently small compared to, I don't know what, maybe there's some effective extra expansion parameter, you can have a double series. I mean, you know, I'm imagining something like this, not just full blown everything where you have to solve right, right. the problem all the way up to the ultraviolet. So, you know, some, something like this. I think right. the, there is actually a sort of applied re, uh, reason why I sort of asked this question. Uh, in solid state physics, there was some sort of uh, rising popularity of this electron hydrodynamics in metals. And of course, that is a very special type of case when the lattice is fixed pretty much in place and the electrons are creating the fluid in that background. And of mm -hmm. course, compressibility <clears throat> and all kinds of issues like that might pop up important in, in many applications and therefore maybe some sort of analog of that um, uh, holographic model, but of course now not holographic, but something else. Yeah. But I was yeah. really trying to approach this from this general scheme, if it can give you some insight into that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I don't know, I have, I have not thought about this. Um, the general scheme, yeah, needs some extra expansion parameters, and maybe you can write down an effective theory that is sensible. 
Mm-hmm. And I, I just my my first thought went to holography because if you do something like this in holography, it will tell you of the structure of the equations of motion. Like you know, like 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 here. Basically, we looked at what are you know. Let's say, so you know, temperature is what sets the 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 device screening length. So let's say you go to the regime where the device screening is small. So you know what happens is that there's no more scale separation between the hydro modes, like alpha waves, let's say, the the momenta of alpha waves and the, the the effective mass of the photon. So they be, they start interacting. And that holography seems to be, you know, you can, we, we even have a scheme of how you sort of separate out everything else. It sort of happily gives you some equation. And this equation is essentially dress Ampere's law with some relaxation time and things like this. And, you know, it's a relaxation time. Of course, here it's computed for N equals to four super young males. Let's say you don't care about it. You just, you know, replace it with your favorite theory. So something like this, I think, could be doable. Some, you know, hybrid mod, hybrid methods using holography to give you the equation. And then you give it your own favorite microscopics of the kind of system you're interested in. I, I think there's some potential for that in the future. But very little has been done like this, right? essentially okay. nothing. Thank you. Thank you. I don't see any raised hands. So first, I want to thank uh, you again for a very nice presentation and taking time to answer all the questions.